So, um, the archaeology of silence in the digital age. First is the question um, which forces affect our subjective views. So, how far are we authors on a known view? And some of our projects are, or the most of our projects, are first and foremost self-experiments. So we are trying ourselves to tinker together something, some tools that we can use that bring us uh, closer to the situation where we can perceive also not on only something outside, but all our own perception. And this is uh, the thing, what is uh, the focus in most of our works. So one's own subjective view on the internet, um, for example, becomes comparable with other spe specific, also specific access uh, on other points. So uh, this is, for example, um, Piggy Day, what we did there. And all the project serves as an invitation to explore the borders of one's own view. So here's some, some examples of internet censorship and um, Iran and blog. Um, this is um, from um, Thailand uh, a website and proxy website. This is from Switzerland <laughs> um, and also in blog from um, Emirates and Flickr website, so this is a porn website in Germany, blocked, and this is a poker gaming, online gaming website blocked here in Slovenia. So um, we see that we have all, always, we are in a specific setting when we are communicating digitally. This here is uh, an example, a picture we got from someone from China, and here this is an advertisement for one of our projects. So it's a billboard to circumvent internet censorship with Picky Day. So in Chinese, this little sign here. With these projects, we are not just reaching out to other people or reaching other people, but we get a lot of things also back. So we, we cannot control these tools. Well, they are, those are open source tools, they are completely free and everyone is free to use it and to um, reprogram it in, or use it in an own way uh, or develop it further in an own way. But with these tools we learn then also uh, and hear back from specific points, from specific people and their um, situation and this is one of the examples from China. There are other examples when we heard last year, year from a flood in Brazil where they used uh, Colnet or um, from a blackout in Ethiopia in September 2016 when they also used Colnet. We got in contact with many people from all around the world. This is an Tibetan activist we learned to know also from Northern Korea. This was very surprising to get an email from Northern Korea, say, but it's true. So there are people they use, they have um, poor internet access and they use also some of our tools. Interesting is that an open communication structure in that way allows them to a communicative exchange and it opens also for us new perspectives in that way. The situation in there we are locked in sometimes also uh, um, is really good to see with the situation what was called the first Twitter revolution. It was in 2009, the Green Revolution in Tehran, in, in Iran, and thousands of Twitter users turned their profile green on green with green signs um, to show solidarity and for users of social media, the protests in Iran were inacceptable, a global story. But uh, investigation in this uh, situation by Al Jazeera confirmed later that only 60 active Twitter users, 60 active Twitter accounts were from Tehran. All the thousands other accounts were not from the ground there. And Iranian bloggers who took part in the protests um, are now very critical um, about this term, about Twitter revolution. Also, these this, um, blogs, these uh, tweets were in English, 
most of them, but uh, the revolution in Tehran is naturally in Farsi. We learned many things about the specific situations and um, how we are always part of a specific setting and of specific communication possibilities. The trust in the narratives of revolutions through these communication possibilities are really traps. Uh, so as we have seen, the idea of a Twitter revolution or of a Facebook revolution is then on the ground mostly uh, the contrary. It comes with a shutdown of the internet and the mobile communication. So this happened in many places and these are some of the events where there was a politically introduced shutdown of all digital communication, internet and mobile phone devices. So one I, I mentioned was Ethiopia where we were in contact with people. So also the natural disasters leads to blackouts and um, one of the examples is uh, from a guy in the um, region where the tsunami happened um, around what, what led them to the Fukushima nuke power meltdown in March 2011. And he wrote, one of the consequences of the internet revolution is that those outside the earthquake zones know or think they know much more than those there are themselves because the infrastructure there is completely collapsed. While we are viewing pictures of the swept away airport of Sendai from Syracuse nor Nairobi, those only 10 kilometers from the scene know nothing yet. So these are the forms where we are locked in or locked out and um, what leads to certain um, situations of silence. And one of the very specific situation is uh, for refugees. And refugees are under a constant um, surveillance. So, and on the other hand, they have nearly no chance to make themselves heard. So um, this is uh, a picture from the refugee camp in Sentili. And this picture we made uh, in 2015 on the Greek island of Lesbos, the hotspot where many asylum seekers stranded. So in the background you see the Turkish coastline and uh, we are working with, since years with many asylum seekers and people on the flight and I think it is very important to remember how data traces for, especially for people on the flight, can be a blessing or a curse. A blessing when it's uh, a signal that can call for help or a real threat when someone is hunted in war zones or on dangerous escape routes. When we use computer connections, then we are always depending on an infrastructure. <laughs> and those infrastructures that um, either we call it the internet here as a scheme or as a mobile uh, phone services are always bound to an infrastructure which is not controlled by us. And um, uh, we were looking into that and thinking on how could we create a system in which we can ourselves communicate with our neighbors where we don't need a server somewhere in the internet, super remote, um, for when something in the connection gets blocked, uh, we are locked out from communication. Um, in 2011, we started to uh, develop develop CallNet for that. It's um, a Wi-Fi mesh network, which means that the um, devices are directly interconnected over Wi-Fi, so there is no need for a centralized um, router. There is nothing centralized here. Um, there is no need for an internet connection. This has also some other um, advantages that we don't need really uh, also mobile uh, services to really um, be able to communicate with other people. We created a project in a way that one can give the software uh, from one device to the other so that the network can build from one device and, and spread and um, that everyone can download it from uh, the network itself and no internet access is needed. We try to um, uh, develop it for as many systems as possible, but especially mobile uh, systems are super important for it. The question is always a bit, 
how far can we really go with connections? This was one of our longest connections, over three and a half kilometers. We did that with very simple materials, with can antennas that you can also see here. Uh, they are ma made of uh, tin cans um, that you can buy everywhere or you already have at home, and a small uh, dipole inside that is seeding the signal. Um, this was one of the locations, and uh, the other uh, was on this uh, island here uh, behind our Chinese friends um, with the other station. And it was perfectly fine to uh, communicate over this distance right, with this simple material. We have been invited to uh, many places um, to kickstart CallNet or also to work with people on their networks. Um, one of it was, uh, for example, in Istanbul in 2013 uh, in the upcoming municipal elections. And it was really interesting to see how the whole internet censorship that uh, contained at this time over 40,000 um, pages uh, was changed overnight from a, a pure DNS censorship that was kind of easy to circumvent from, for everyone to um, a censorship where the whole DNS um, port was hijacked and um, one had still the idea to communicate with a free um, a server or a surfer, surfer outside and one always got uh, trapped then in uh, this censorship and we see that Twitter and YouTube um, were blocked at the time. So it is possible also to uh, connect this network to the internet and also to create interfaces for it, for example, for YouTube or, Twi or Twitter or Facebook or whatever one wants to do. The um, interest in, in going into the system and learning about the system was huge. We had several workshops there with super many people that, that were then afterwards doing new workshops with other people to um, finally uh, create this network and of course with also the idea to have a uh, link over the Bosporus. I think the, the interesting thing in Istanbul, or for me, the, the most remarkable thing was that people were very divided by the political discussion in this time, so about the Erdogan um, party, uh, major party, and um, their um, idea of a progress, of a economical progress from, for the country, and people, they were against it because they were um, frightened by the um, things that come with it or um, by the um, sheer um, also uh, situation about the policy, how the policy was made um, from this uh, government. And um, in, this, in this situation, so also the, the digital communication played a, a big role because it was some tools were mostly used by younger people, by students and so on. And so it was, it was then also spread the world that those are all only lies. So what, what happened in Gezi Park would be only a lie, and the official media didn't um, cover that story. So um, this was then the outcome, what, what you see over there, the, the Gezi Park edition, so it's an independent um, network. It spreads from this uh, mobile uh, devices. Another situation, um, where we see people really locked in or out is um, the situation for many Roma families in Europe. And those are two pictures. One is from Naples in Italy, um, where they burned down an um, um, in informal settlement. Um, on the other side, you see a, race, a racist right-wing protest and threat to Roma families in Kosovo. So um, Romani peoples were until uh, 1856 in Romania enslaved. And so um, this is a really um, tragedy and a very sad story for many families. And being present, being represented by uh, pictures, for example, is for families, for many families, the same moment when they become visible in this uh, representation of photographs is for many people the exactly same moment when they got destroyed or 
erased or here killed. This is a, a sign from the Nazi regime in Germany. And so they, they took the first pictures of these persons and it was the same moment when they started to, to um, threaten them. Roma families are not only endangered by the direct attacks from racists, they are also systematically excluded by police forces or by administration law. So this is Europe, this is the 21st century, and it's not poverty, it's not racism, not exclusion that are new. What is new is how these realities are hidden and how people are made to disappear. Informal settlements are considered as illegal and therefore those living in them don't have a right to recognition and participation. So one cannot speak up when you are not in a legal situation. And on the, count, on the contrary, each time when they appear, each time when they express themselves, that gives ground for further persecution, exclusion and limitation. And so this is an informal settlement in France and was then demolished as soon as this informal settlement um, got um, in the news or in, the, in, in a broader perception. So this is what happens with um, many situations. So you are really locked out. Many Roma families around Paris, in the banlieue from Paris, we started to make um, local neighborhood networks and connections to their informal um, settlements because they are excluded by law to have a, a stable and durable um, internet connection. Uh, to have a stable and affordable internet connection in France, you need to have a fixed address and a bank account and they have often not this privilege. And so in the settlements they had no um, fixed uh, internet access. And what we did with this neighborhood uh, network, you see here on the building uh, over the canal um, in Saint-Denis, and we built um, a network to the informal settlement from the roof of this building. And so did we many, we did many um, neighborhood networks and tinkered also this kind of antennas because it's very easy to, to build these antennas. So they had quickly also um, own ideas how to do it and improved our systems and, and did huge um, networks and huge antennas. This antenna is uh, so high to come over the the trees here because it's best when you have a clear sight and the network in this settlement. So another point we had the problem that it was not possible to make a direct connection to the neighborhood and so we installed a bicycle between the, the um, one network and the other local network. So this um, bicycle works then as a file transfer and it's not a simultaneous file transfer, it's not synchronous, it's asynchronous with a delay and technical spoken, it's a delay tolerant network. So, and here you see the bike and we built this bike um, in the informal settlement. So we had no connection there and um, so we started to make a system that we can put the bike, so on the bike, was then a an, an, um, car battery used because they had it, so for the energy for, as a battery, so and then it came a little um, small Raspberry Pi, so a very little computer on the top, so this relation. And um, then you could give, you can give a, a certain um, job to this bike, uh, for example a download of a video or sending of an email or um, doing a, a request and then you can travel through the town with this bike and then if you come to an um, open Wi-Fi access so the bike uh, is then um, capable to do the login at, uh, automatically and do all the jobs and so then yes here this is in a park in, in, in Paris where you have free Wi-Fi access and so then you travel back to your um, informal settlement and this is how 
file transfer can be made. So, yeah, it is interesting from an artistic point of view is our opportunities to exercise participation and to express oneself is always bound to a certain order. And if you become aware of the constellation, the terms and the conditions of communication, it not only broadens our horizon, it allows us to look behind the regulations that limit our world view. In 2014, we have been invited by the Swiss Embassy in Berlin to present our art projects. And this invitation really thrilled us because the Swiss Embassy in Berlin is special. It is the only old building in the government district and it sits right next to the federal chancellery. So no one is closer to Chancellor Merkel than the Swiss diplomats. In uh, the government district in Berlin, there is also the Reichstag, Germany's parliament, and the Brandenburg Gate. And right next to the gate, there are other embassies, in particular, the US and the British embassy. Over the last years, we learned that from the roof of the American and the British embassies, the secret services have uh, been listening to the entire district, even to the mobile phone of Angela Merkel. The antennas of the British GCHQ were hidden in this wide cylindrical radon, while the listening post of the American NSA was covered by radio transparent screens. But how to address these hidden and disguised forces? We accepted the invitation of the Swiss Embassy and used this opportunity to exploit this specific situation. If people are spying on us, it stands to reason that they have to listen to what we are saying. So, on the roof of the Swiss Embassy, we installed a series of antennas. They weren't as sophisticated as those used by the Americans and the British. Um, they were makeshift can antennas, not camouflaged and totally obvious and visible. The Academy of Arts joined the project, and so we built another large antenna on their rooftop, exactly between the listening posts of the NSA and the GCHQ. Never have we been observed in such detail. While building this art installation, a helicopter circled over our heads with a camera that registered each and every move we made, and on the roof of the American embassy, security officers patrolled. Although Germany is an advanced democracy, citizens are limited in their constitutional rights in its government district. The right of assembly and the right to demonstrate are restricted there. But um, uh, though this uh, is restricted, there is no specific law related to digital communication. Our installation was therefore perfectly legal and the Swiss ambassador informed Chancellor Merkel about it. We called the project, Can You Hear Me? The antennas created an open and free Wi-Fi communication network in which anyone who wanted to would be able to participate uh, with any Wi-Fi enabled device and send messages to those listening on the frequencies that were being intercepted. Text messages, voice chats, file sharing, anything could be sent anonymously. And people did communicate. Over 15,000 messages were sent. And uh, here are some of the examples. Hello world, hello Berlin, hello NSA, hello GCHQ. This is the NSA Achilles heel, open network. NSA agents do the right thing, blow the whistle. This is the NSA, in God we trust, all others we track. Agents, what was the story of yourself? Will you tell your grandchildren? Oh, I'm will not going to read this, um, but it means do not spy on me in binary code. Make love, not cyber war. At NSA, my neighbors are noisy. Please send a drone strike. <laughs> Anonymous is watching, NSA, GCHQ, we are part of your organizations, expect us, we will shut down. Can You Hear Me created a platform to discuss the potential and the limits of communication. We invited the embassies and government departments to participate in this open network too, and to our surprise, they did. Files appeared on the network, including classified documents leaked from a parliamentary investigation commission 
which highlights the fact um, that free exchange and discussion of vital information is starting to become difficult even for members of a parliament. We should not take it for granted to be boundlessly connected. We should start making our own connections, fighting for this idea of an equal and globally interconnected old world. This is essential to overcome our speechlessness and the uh, separations provoked by rival political forces. Thank you.